I'm being joined right now by Mary Jane Black, author of the beautiful book called She Rode a Harley, A Memoir of Love and Motorcycles. Welcome, Mary Jane. So we're going to be having a discussion about this, uh, this, this book where you look back on love and motorcycles and you weave the story of your life around leaving an abusive marriage, becoming an empowered woman, getting a, an education, becoming a teacher, and falling in love and learning to ride motorcycles and then losing that love. That's a hell of a story. It, it does have all the elements. It's several life stories probably twined into one. Very much so. So let's start with your first marriage. Um, that was a, an abusive marriage on many levels. Let's talk about that because, you know, that's a taboo subject that a lot of women actually really need to hear about. I uh, married young. I was, you know, barely 18 when I married my first husband. It was not an, a marriage of great passion and love. It was someplace for stability and sort of a safety away from my parents' marriage, which I, ironically enough was also a, a struggling, abusive marriage. Uh, I was married 23 years to this man. It became physically abusive over the course of the years. It I was always emotionally abusive. I uh, planned and my escape from the marriage very carefully for about seven or eight years before I left because I knew I had to make money and save it to get an apartment. Some of the things that women have to think about when they escape is that you have to have some place to go. And I was taking a teenage daughter with me. So I had to find an apartment and there's things attached to that, like utilities and telephones and, and deposits. So I went back to college to get a job outside of waiting tables and to make more money. I went to college thinking I might be pre-law and became an English teacher by chance and design and learned to love and be passionate about teaching high school students writing and reading. But certainly I went primarily for the paycheck and then learned to love what I did for the paycheck. And you had children at home. I did. I uh, had followed the advice of many a minister and certainly people who were allegedly wiser than I, that leaving that marriage where my children were small would devastate them and destroy their lives forever and all those words of wisdom I think many women hear. So when I did leave, my daughter was 15, soon to be 16. She was a sophomore in high school. And my son was 20, almost 21, and was not living at home. He had went off to community college and an apartment of his own. So let's talk about living in that toxic environment and what it does to children and how two children living in the same environment came away with such very, very different views about that environment and what went on. Certainly, if you ask my daughter, she would not even believe her brother grew up in the same household, but she obviously was more aware of what was happening and chose to go with me. My son was in many ways his father's son. And my regret is that I didn't take him out of that environment when he was young, but I didn't. And so he grew up with that father who was a good father to him. They hunted together, they did all the things together. So I will say that the abuse did not extend to the children. And so many times when my son and I would try to talk about this, he would say he didn't understand because for him, it was a perfect family. He had a mother and a father and everything was fine for him. He didn't know what was happening and I got really good at pretending and that's my fault also. I think many of us pretend everything's fine. We put a nice face on it instead of letting people maybe see the ugliness beneath the mask. And so you didn't have to protect children from violence, but you did have to try to insulate them from the verbal abuse, um, certain things that would transpire that you really didn't want them to be party to or privy to. How did you hide those things from them? Well, you know, I think they were obviously, I don't think I hid them as well as I thought I did. 
certainly Stephanie, my daughter, would say I didn't hide them very well. She was well aware. I think my son chose not to see them. I also think that probably the worst thing I did was allow him to grow up believing that is the way a husband treats a wife. And, and I know that he certainly, his first and only marriage ended when his wife left him. And, and I've always wondered if there was something going on there also. He has not, he does live with someone right now, but he is not married and will not marry again, I believe. And I wonder, you know, um, when we're young, we're having children, we're trying to have that normal appearing life on the surface. We never really consider the long-term ramifications of some of our choices, you know, and some of those ramifications are like you say, a son who may or may not be treating his spouse in that dictator type fashion. Well, you know, and I was young too. I was, I, I had no other experience. I had the same experience, you know, as a daughter of a, an abusive marriage. So I was doing the best I could with what I had. And, and it was just some inner core of me knew it wasn't acceptable. And I chose a different path. I was 41, but I finally said enough and I walked away. Now, what was it that triggered you to finally start planning? It took you, you said about eight years right. to, to set everything. What, what was that straw that broke the camel's back that made you finally decide, you know what, I, I need to leave? It was a combination of things. I finally made it through college. I graduated from college after four years. And my mother had returned home and she had become ill. She had always been separated and this kind of sort of estranged from me and lived in another town. She returned back to our hometown and was diagnosed with colon cancer. So my mother was really ill. I was graduating college and my husband refused to let her stay in her house. And she came to my college graduation and he refused to sit with her. He, he took me home and would let me talk to her. I think at that moment, I thought, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Because your mother is your mother, whether you're estranged from her or not, she's still that significant person. Um, and, and that's a, that's a tough test, right? Absolutely. So you make, you start making the plans, right. um, you start deciding where you want to live, what you want to do. Take us through that, that eight year period. And actually, by that point, it was about four years because I'd had the four years of college planning and right. saving. Okay, right. But truthfully, I knew I had to stay in the town. My daughter was in high school there. I had a tenured teaching job at a high school there, was making decent money and, and loved my work. And my mother was now living there and was ill. So I knew I had to stay there. So I did lots of you know, spending a little bit more writing a check back, back in the day when we still wrote checks, I could write a check for groceries that was 30 or $40 more than I actually spent and get cash. So I saved my money. I identified high security buildings in the town. I made sure I spoke to, you know, security and my administration at the school. So it took about four years to get everything in place and get the money. I had to decide how to tell Stephanie and also made the decision not to tell my son after he had told my his father previously about a planned leaving. So those plans took a while and the money especially took a while to carefully embezzle truthfully a lot of money because enough money to leave because he watched every dime that came out of our joint checking account. So you finally get the courage up, you have the money, you have everything organized, you leave and what happens? Well, I had left a note for him. I, uh, my mother brought the U-Haul and my cousin, we, I had rented secretly and we loaded it up. I, I laugh now that I took exactly half thinking that was some kind of gift and he hated me just as much as if I'd taken all of it. And I thought, why, why didn't I clean out the house? Uh, but I took half, got, you know, settled into the apartment and it was one of those gated secured he didn't it took him a while to find me and he obviously was smart enough to come to the school i was teaching he knew where i got and it i made sure that i always went out the main door and people in the office knew not to send him to my 
classroom. And you file for divorce. You start yeah. making those proceedings to break free. Bye. And you fall in love. Yeah, I go on a blind date for with a friend who believed, you know, that her husband worked with Dwayne and he was in town. He worked with him in Bryan, Texas, and he was in town. So we were going to have, she thought he needed a, a female to have dinner with. And so she set up this date and realized I was single. Really was not interested. I was deep into the separating myself from my previous marriage and, and trying to, you know, work and be a single mother. But I thought, why not? I can prove that, you know, there is life out there. <laughs> and you fall in love pretty hard. And pretty quick, you find yourself in a position where you're moving to Texas. Yeah, it was it was a bumpy start. I met Dwayne on the blind date and he came he was on his way to Cleveland, Ohio to install elephant cages at the Cleveland Zoo. And on his way home from Cleveland, he stopped and I, I went with him in the truck back to Bryan, Texas. I met, his I met his mother and his daughter. So it seemed to happen fast. About a month after that, he called and he had lost his job at that company. And one of the things I learned early on with Dwayne, he was not good at not having a job and not having anything to do. So he, we really broke up officially for several weeks, months actually. And so when I started to tell that story in the memoir about how we came back together, but it took a while. It was a bumpy start. But within a year or so, yeah, we were planning to, to get married and I was going to move to Texas because my daughter needed to be, she needed to be out of that town too. And so you break free of all of those chains. You leave the town where, and move to a place where nobody really knows your story. There's none of those entanglements. You don't have to run into somebody's ex or any of those situations. And your relationship really gets the chance to flourish. Yes. And, and certainly, I, I think both Dwayne and I learned what a real marriage could be in a partnership. And we certainly learned that together. You know, I think both of us were focused on our daughters who were teenagers, which is not the best start for any marriage to have a 14-year-old and a 17-year-old. But certainly, we, be, we became a family of four. And, you know, I traveled with him a bit for his job when he got it back. And then I went back to teaching and motorcycles and then Harleys, one of the decisions Dwayne made was to work, to quit this traveling job and get a job at the Harley shop in town, which was being run by a friend of his who had just been bought by a friend of his. And so he became a Harley mechanic again. And that introduced me into that world and reintroduced him back into that world. And so from there, you guys build yourselves a motorcycle. And pretty soon, you're riding your own machine. Yeah. And we talked about this previously, where you became very independently dependent on each other. Um, you each had your own lives, the things that you thrived on, that you loved to do, your jobs. You, you, but the motorcycle really kind of brings you guys closer in a way that you've never been before. Yeah, I, I think it was a surprise to Dwayne, and so it was a surprise to me how much I loved the biker world and Harleys. It wasn't, it, both him and the Harleys were a surprise for me. Plus, those Harleys also blended our worlds in, in some strange and wonderful ways. I could hang out in Harley shops and those mechanics. I rode with them. I went on the blowy runs. But also, when we had parties at our house, my school friends, my teacher friends would come, his biker friends would come, and all these different clubs that we rode with. So it became, both worlds became melded, and everybody seemed to enjoy that, and certainly we did, so that all those different fragments of our lives kind of came together in, with motorcycles. So you, you're living this life filled with joy, filled with love, filled with a certain amount of security and contentment for the first time probably ever in your life. 
And then comes the diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. Yeah, about 10 years after we moved to California and we had was sharing that secure life, uh, there have been some bumps along the way. We had started over in a small town in Sonoma County and he was gonna finally open his own custom motorcycle shop. And I had found a job as a principal at a small high school, which allowed me less stress. Uh, and he became, his mother, it was, a, it was a heck of a 2009. His mother became suddenly ill and she was in her nineties and had never been ill and died quickly. And then about two months later, we discovered that Dwayne was ill. He had become sick right around the time she died. We thought stress and he was diagnosed originally with gallbladder. They thought he would have to have his gallbladder removed, but when they did the scan and the MRI, they found a huge mass in his pancreas and that was the diagnosis and it was Thanksgiving, so. And how did you guys learn to let go and still live your lives? Um, because that was a big theme. Um, you, you've had to let go of the past. You had to let go of so many things to get to Dwayne. And then you have to let him go to the other side. It, it, that was a, certainly a journey. And like many people who face this diagnosis, we, we start off with the, and you see this all the time when people are diagnosed with this disease, that you're gonna beat it. And certainly that is, was our start that we began that way. And we were determined to be the one that, that beats pancreatic cancer. And we certainly tried and his initial chemotherapy was hugely successful and the tumor shrank and he seemed to get better. We were able to take another motorcycle trip together. And then about a year in that treatment began to fail and he tried various clinical trials. There was no quality of life anymore. And I think Dwayne and I, and I certainly have friends who've gone through this who make different decisions, but Dwayne and I sat down and realized that we didn't want to live that kind of life. And so what we had to let go of was the idea that some miracle was gonna happen. And so we lived each day. We truly lived each day, each moment. He passes and you decide after a few years of doing a little bit of healing and trying to come to terms and acceptance to write this memoir. What is the biggest message that you want people taking away from your book? I think probably it, there are a couple messages here. Yes. Is that, mm -hmm. that love really can exist and that you will find people when you most need them to come into your life. And also that love doesn't end with death, that grief goes on forever. It changes, you know, it becomes more integrated into your life. It's not as painful as it once was, but that you really don't get over it. I think there's a sort of this myth in our culture that after about a year or two, you're over it. And people, you know, are uncomfortable. You continue to talk about your grief. But the fact is, it's always a part of you. Dwayne's always a part of my life. It's not over. No. And that no matter what the next steps are, that that part of my life is still a part of my life. It's not gone. And grief, I'm still in grief. And it's okay. And I think, you know, that's one of the things that I found very empowering about your book is the fact that in one book, you discover, uncover, and rip the blinds off of a number of taboos in our society. The whole domestic abuse, the verbal abuse, the, the, the feeling of being a hostage almost in your own home all the way to estrangement with your child. Right. You know, like those are topics that most women need to hear, but they're scared to talk about in a lot of cases still. And so it's been a very empowering read and a very empowering discussion because it's so frank. And it's just, when things are that smooth, I listen to you. I see your heart. I feel your heart. And when I read your words, you take me back to different points in time in my life where our paths kind of cross, you know? 
right. a little bit parallel, but they kind of dip in and out a little yeah. bit here and there. And I think almost any woman of a certain age, if she's over 19 and been in a relationship, there's something in this book for all of them. Well, I, I do believe women are stronger than they think they are. And that really, you have to kind of count on that core of strength that all of us have. We just have to trust ourselves because I think too many times men or other people will make us feel that we aren't capable and we have to sort of listen to our own hearts. Well, and I think, again, it comes back down to the old adage, um, no one can take your power away unless you willingly give it up. Right. 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 And so that becomes kind of a theme throughout your whole book is that, okay, I lost my power. I'm taking it back. I lost my power. I'm taking it back. I found my power. And now, no matter what happens to me, I'm seated in a place of power. Right. Yes. And I, I always used to tell those teenage girls I taught that, you know, the only behavior you really can change is your own. And so you have to change your own destiny. You can't change a man. You can't count on a man to change it. It's, it's up to you. I think one other lesson that, that, book, that your book has to offer women is the fact that when we look at relationships, we have to remember we're only a 50% partner. Right. We only hold 50% of the blame, 50% of the, the, the of accolades, 50% of whatever. Right. And too often, the mothering instinct in us, that martyrdom that oftentimes right. women are raised up with, comes out and we think, it's all me. What, what did I do wrong? Oh, my God. And then we learn as we mature that, no, no, he really was unkind. He really was a jerk. Yeah. And you're okay alone. I think too many women are afraid of being alone. I certainly have some friends who are widows and, and they rush into relationships because they really can't stand to be alone. And, and you have to be okay with, on your own. Yeah, I think that's the other thing, right? Uh, that message when you go through that rocky period and you're finding your own way, your heart is crushed, you're, you're longing and wishing, but at the same time, you're just also like a force forging ahead. Right. And I think every woman does that. She just doesn't realize it. And I think you're verbalizing it and putting it so eloquently on paper will help a lot of other women understand they're not alone, this isn't unique to them, that this is part of that age old question between men and women and where do we really fit in and, and how do we learn to love each other, respect each other on a global level. Yeah, absolutely. You know? So I want to thank you very much for your time. Oh, it, well, it's thank a beautiful you. book. And um, I'm going to make sure that the audience knows how to find your book right now. So can you tell them a little bit about where they can get your book? Certainly you can go to my website, maryjaneblack.com. And there will be links there for both Amazon and IndieBound. And I, you can also find it on Barnes & Noble if you search the site with the title, She Wrote a Harley, it will come up. It's on most bookstore websites now under the title. So you can certainly do that. But the website, you can contact me. You can see pictures. You can certainly interact with me on the website. Absolutely. Again, Mary Jane Black. She wrote a Harley, a memoir of love and motorcycles. And um, a book that even the guys would probably truly enjoy. There's they a just biker like, stories in there. Just a few. <laughs> Just a few. Thank you again very much for your time.